Okay, hello. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Joya Mukherjee, um, who's a pediatrician, a public health and disease specialist, as well as an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. And since 2000, um, she's been the chief medical director of Partners in Health. Um, they provide pre preventative healthcare, uh, and alongside colleagues, she's extended social programs um, in countries including Haiti, Liberia, and Peru. Her expertise in global health in HIV and tuberculosis um, meant that she was um, able to lead teams from Partners in Health in supporting states and cities in their response to COVID-19. Um, Dr. Mukherjee runs the master's program at Harvard, and this is in global health delivery. Here she trains clinicians, scholars uh, from across the globe to design, evaluate, and implement systems to deliver high quality healthcare. Because of her expertise in infectious diseases, uh, in health systems and social justice, she serves on the board of directors of Village Health Works, and this is in Burundi, of Project Muso in Mali, and the Institute for D Justice and Democracy with a focus between US and Haiti. She also consults the World Health Organization and other international agencies. Um, so please, can we give her a warm welcome? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with all of you. Uh, very much looking forward to talking to youth leaders uh, about the important um, time that we're in right now. And my remarks are gonna be focused on the COVID epidemic, but really on the concept of pandemic preparedness and how health equity and justice must be central when we think of pandemic preparedness and response. And this will be reflecting on my work uh, over the last 25 years, now on my fifth pandemic, HIV, tuberculosis, cholera, Ebola, and now COVID. And in each one, we see emerging patterns of inequity and injustice. So uh, the first um, comment is that inequity is lethal. And while I am a physician and I've studied biology, uh, genetics, immunology, et cetera, it is really the social forces that determine whether people live or die. Um, on the map, you see two stations on the orange line, six minutes apart, Roxbury Crossing and Back Bay Station. The distance is just 1.5 miles. The populations are Americans living in these two parts of the city of Boston. And when you travel between those two stations, six minutes on the train, there is a life expectancy difference of 30 years. And here you see Roxbury, which is a predominantly poor and black neighborhood. Uh, and the life expectancy as compared with other places in the world, um, Haiti, Congo, Iraq. Um, and then you see Back Bay, a very affluent section of Boston where the life expectancy is more than 90. So what does that tell you about pandemics? Well, what it tells you is that it is much more than a microbe that causes mortality. It is much more than a genetic phenomenon. It is much more than a healthy lifestyle. There's something much more complicated going on. So I wanna root my comments in the notions of human rights and what we call the social determinants of health. The social determinants of health are the social forces in which we live, all of us, and the contributions of those social forces to health and the, the related human rights that they address. So let's just take the pervasive uh, problem of hunger, starvation and food insecurity. Many of you who are American um, saw long lines at food pantries, even people driving up in cars. Food insecurity, despite the wealth that we have is extremely, uh, common, particularly during the pandemic and around the world is shockingly common. Human rights does say that we have a right to food in multiple articles of human rights conventions. 
uh, what does that mean? That means that the government should subsidize food as you see with something like food stamps or give food as you see with things like school lunch. Uh, but it, it's not doing that at scale in our country and it's we're definitely not doing that around the world. So without the, so these social determinants of hunger, starvation, food insecurity result in particular diseases, um, including cognitive impairment, stunting tuberculosis, and why? Because without food, you have impaired immunity. So this is just one way to think about these huge disparities in health that we see in the United States and around the world and how those discrepancies relate to real human rights issues. Um, we can talk about overcrowding, the, the crisis of unhoused people. And again, there is a right to shelter without the, the proper housing. People have exposure to the elements they have inadequate ventilation and there are many associated diseases or conditions related to that. So you can go down the, the line and see that there, that when you look at this life, dis, uh, the uh, expectancy discrepancy between these two areas in a very affluent city of Boston, it's much more around human rights issues, uh, risk for disease based on those lack of human rights and then conditions. And so, it would come as no surprise to any of you then understanding that when we saw that COVID uh, hit that neighborhood of Roxbury much harder than it did the more affluent neighborhood of Back Bay. And, you know, this is an airborne um, contagion. And so one would think we all breathe, it's in all of our air, but it is not equal. Um, and so, uh, these, I just want to start with that framing of social determinants of health so we can think about how we look at COVID. So at the very end of 2019, uh, a very esteemed group of people, uh, the Nuclear Threat Institute, the Johns Hopkins University, and the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit of the Economist magazine, uh, put forward something called the Global Health Security Index. And it was really to look at who would be prepared for disasters. Now, this came out at the end of 2019. So just as the first glimmers, right, that COVID-19 might be a global pandemic, it was still just in China. Um, they, they measured the preparedness on an input of factors from the World Health Organization, from financial analyses, and from what they deemed to be the, the status of the health system. And then countries were analyzed by looking at these factors. And the factors are depicted below. Prevention. How good is a country at looking at and preventing the emergence of new diseases. How good is our surveillance, our monitoring? The second is detection. How are we able to detect things? How is our laboratory system, our testing, our feedback loops? Uh, third is rapid response. Can we respond rapidly? Do we have the political will um, and the mechanisms to respond rapidly? And then how good is the health system, of course, to treat the sick and also to protect health workers. Um, and then the last two are kind of a more macro level view. What is the compliance of the government with global norms? So in international conventions, there are stipulations of trying to work together uh, across uh, global norms when there is a pandemic. And that's why it's important when the WHO, the World Health Organization, then declares a public health emergency because there are expectations from all countries. And then there's the risk environment, the, what is the overall risk and vulnerability? And that's that can be a very big tent and we can talk about that more in the question and answer, how do you assess that overall risk environment. So this is the uh, ranking 
that was put together again at the end of 2019 before we had a, a multinational pandemic. Um, and as you can see, the, the United States is at the top uh, with the highest score, the most prepared. Um, and many countries are you know, down here at the bottom. Um, and I'm just gonna point out a couple of countries because I, I will be making remarks about them. Sorry. Um, Belgium, uh, sort of middle of the pack, uh, but on the higher end, sort of not full middle, but you know, in the higher quintile of preparedness. Um, and then here's Rwanda, uh, clearly below the median. So when we look back at these, uh, that these areas that were assessed, we see, okay, they're looking at prevention, is there surveillance going on, detection, right? We went through these. So it, it maybe isn't surprising that the United States with the world's largest economy, state-of-the-art hospitals, uh, you know, would fare so well. You see up here the UK, um, interestingly, Thailand, which we can talk about in a bit. Um, India right in the middle uh, that fared pretty poorly in the in the beginning. But let's talk about these other smaller countries, Belgium and Rwanda. I'm going to use those as an example. So a lot of pandemic response can be judged by the response in the first month of a pandemic, because when you have a rapidly spreading pathogen with a geometric progression, right, every five people infect another 50 people, infect another 500 people, right, then you really have to do that early containment. So I'm taking three very similarly sized places, the state of Georgia, uh, with 10 million people, the home of the CDC, uh, the nation of Belgium with uh, 11 million people, uh, the former colonial master of Rwanda, and the nation of Rwanda with 12 million people. Um, in the first 30 days in Georgia, from the first uh, recognition of a case to the end of the first 30 days, you had 4,400 cases in Georgia. In Belgium, there were 7,400. And in Rwanda, there were just 134. Meanwhile, when you look at the doctors per 1,000 population, a, a standard measurement of doctor coverage, you see that Rwanda has significantly fewer uh, physicians. So what is going on? that made the early response in Rwanda so much stronger than countries with significantly more wealth, significantly more human resources. That, that is the question um, that we're gonna address. And here's just a schematic, again, of the first couple of months. This isn't only the first month uh, where you see Georgia going way off the scale um, and Rwanda staying at a very, very low rate. So, um, you know, I once studied a little bit of engineering, maybe some of you have too, and this is kind of an engineering diagram of forces, right? And forces are, are generally depicted as an arrow that has both a magnitude, a size of the arrow and a direction. And the way I think of social determinants of health is also as having a magnitude and a direction. So if you think about the force of, of um, racism in the United States, uh, housing policy, employment, access to education, healthcare, these are really large scale forces very significantly pushing in a direction away from health equity. Um, so, so too, do we think about how we respond as having a magnitude and a direction? Because what I have learned over many years is one can respond to these social forces. So as a doctor, I would be trained to deal with just the microbe, but as a social medicine practitioner, my training and my practice is really to say, where does this microbe exist in society? And how do we change the playing field of society to make the health equity less? So when you think about COVID, 
COVID is very neutral, right? It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have a politi any politics. It doesn't have uh, it, there are no people that are more or less immune by and large. But what you see is that countries that were controlling COVID were different than, than countries that had chaos. So what are the forces that move to control versus chaos, right? And so really one of the main things we, we saw was that um, the biologic factors are only one thing pushing, but there are many more social and political factors that are leading to chaos and a lack of control, which we've seen in the United States, um, than not. And that the countries that really did well had the factors that pushed back on the forces were things like funding equity, and I'll talk about that in a minute, minute political leadership that really tried to tackle the uh, epidemic, and trust that people had in the system. These are, again, are not biologic phenomena. These are really social phenomena. So when you think of this, uh, this cascade that was discussed, what is not in the cascade, right? What's not in the cascade are these more fuzzy things like what is our moral basis for care, compassion, solidarity, mutuality. Um, in some cases, for example, there are many countries where people were given a monthly stipend um, so that they could live and not have to go out and try to fend for themselves. You know, that is a care strategy uh, based on solidarity. Equity, uh, and I will talk more about that, is a, is attention to the most vulnerable. So uh, in many cities, for example, that I've worked in across the United States, there was a clear focus from the mayors and from the you know the political powers that be to focus on unhoused people, understanding that they would be more vulnerable and provide shelter for them, whether in hotel rooms or or other places. Um, and then trust, you know, there are people who do trust their health system that can sound crazy to Americans, but um, they feel that they get good quality health care. And then, of course, leadership, which is not mentioned in this. I tend to think of this now that I've lived in this environment, as we all have for the last three years almost with the pandemic. I tend to think of the leadership aspect as this compliance, global norms, and risk environment. Because if you have leadership that rejects logic, uh, that is not held accountable, that really is hard to deal with the risks. Um, and so um, I think these are very important things that we saw break down in the United States. So you know, Partners in Health, as was mentioned in that kind introduction, we were asked to uh, you know, so of course, in the 12 countries we work in around the globe, we were deep involved in trying to figure out the COVID response in places like Rwanda and Haiti, um, even Kazakhstan. Um, but then we were asked to, how could we help here? And so these are our general principles, right? First of all, support leadership that is well-meaning, that is doing the right thing. Uh, we call that accompaniment. Uh, we call a lot of things accompaniment, but which, which is really putting yourself in the service of the work. Um, and we try to accompany leadership through global advocacy and, and material support. So in some countries, for example, in Lesotho, we help the government write a grant to assure that the health workers in Lesotho would all have the proper PPE, the protective gear, which they would not have gotten without this additional money. Um, we always focus on care, it, you know, really trying to figure out what care will people need. Um, sometimes it is material support to stay home. That's a very critical piece. Sometimes it is the actual medical care. We've done a lot of work to improve oxygen supply and the uh, production of oxygen around the world um, and trust, which is not something you can build in the middle of a pandemic. And I think 
it's very difficult um, in a system that is broken um, to think that people are going to come forward. And we saw this a lot in Ebola in West Africa in 2014 through 17, where the health system had never worked for people. Now there is this dread disease, and the last thing they want to do is come to a healthcare setting because they don't trust that they will walk out alive. Um, and so some of these leadership care trust, these are things we have to build in the between times. And I think that's why my focus and our focus at Partners in Health on pandemic preparedness is really building equitable health systems all the time. And that will allow us to prepare. And then equity, which I mentioned, is, is how do you focus on the most vulnerable? Because we know how the outcomes will always last. So if you do one thing for everybody, the same thing, it's always going to be inequitable because some people don't need it. So for example, you know, I didn't need a child tax credit. I, you know, I had um, I, I have a full-time job. I was able to work during the pandemic. I own my own home. So the equity would say support the single mom of three kids who doesn't, who's lost her job during the pandemic, put more money into that. And um, there are lots of ways to think about resourcing and supporting equity as an agenda. So, you know, these are what, what I think we were fortunate about at Partners in Health is we'd been through a lot of pandemics. Uh, and we had in, you know, in service of providing healthcare to the most vulnerable people, we had developed strategies for equity and for justice and for care. Um, and one was the use of, and the employment, the training, the participation, the collegiality of our community health workers. Um, on the left here, you see a longtime community health worker in Haiti, her name's Heroj Charles. Um, and she has for a long time visited people in their homes to bring longitudinal treatment to people who lived far from clinic. She is a kind person. She is able to give people encouragement, food, water. Uh, and many of our community health workers are, are also former patients, so they know what that journey is like. Um, that was a tool we used actually during the tuberculosis uh, treatment program that was started in the 80s because we realized that for people to get to the clinic every day for their medicines was going to result in inequity. The people who lived the closest could get there. The people who lived the farthest could not. The people who could pay for transportation could get there. The people who could not pay for transportation could not. So if you don't understand the barriers and their impact on the inequity of outcomes, uh, it's hard to design a system. So community health workers were really critical in bridging these challenges. And while we initially deployed them in the in the service of TB treatment and caring for TB patients, we found that that was a robust and important network in terms of, of then addressing what was for us the next pandemic, which was HIV. Um, so what about HIV? What did we learn? Well, we learned that community health workers and community-based organizations were very critical in reducing stigma and encouraging one another. And this is actually from my first trip to Rwanda in 2004, where there were organized groups of people living with HIV waiting for therapy. So you could put together any plan you wanted in the capital city, but in the rural areas, people were already organized and they knew what they needed and wanted. And so meeting and working with community and experience we had from tuberculosis was part of the system strengthening that allowed us to uh, address HIV. Um, I think there is an important notion that I learned probably more during natural disasters than pandemics, which is the idea of solidarity with people who are suffering. We saw this a lot in Ebola as well, uh, but this is a picture from the um, a camp of internally displaced people in Haiti. Uh, after the 2010 earthquake, the, the colleagues in the orange shirts and this gentleman in the green are from Partners in Health. And we uh, worked with the, the you know, camp and the government asked us to, 
to take on the provision of health care in this camp uh, because no one else would go. It was in what was called a red zone, a dangerous zone uh, with gang violence, etc. But of course, we didn't have any problem with security because we were a valuable, you know, bringing valuable services that people wanted. We were sitting together with people in the camp. We worked with the leaders of the camp and we never had a single incident in two years with any kind of violence to our staff or property. And so when we think about global health security versus a solidarity uh, mindset, which is really getting close to people instead of building walls and fences, uh, you know, from our experience, the solidarity approach is much, uh, much more durable um, and important. And just for example, the American military at this time had food that they wanted to give out to residents of this camp. And they said, well, what days are you partners in health here? And we said, well, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And they said, okay, we want to deliver food on one of those days. And we said, no, 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 you should do it on a day we don't have clinic. And they said, no, no, we need you. This is the American military. We need you to provide security. <laughs> so they understood that the security we had was really through relationships and not through the barrel of a gun or a separation between, between us. Um, and then the last thing, you know, we have, uh, which goes along with community health workers, but it's in addition that we talked about the equity. What is that? Well, it's providing transportation, it's providing food, mental health services, doing the additional things. If you focus on just the disease, you know, what is this disease? You miss really the big picture. Um, and, you know, many patients have said, you know, providing, there's a Haitian proverb that, you know, treating a disease uh, without food is like uh, washing your hands and wiping them in dirt. So people have a very keen awareness that these other areas, whether it's shelter or food, are as critical in their healing. And we must be too if we want to be uh, ready to provide good care for people. And lastly, you know, well, not lastly, and additionally, uh, trust, right? What is, how does one build trust? Again, it's hard to build in a pandemic. In healthcare, trust is providing high quality and compassionate care. If you do that, you will build trust. You know, and this uh, is a picture on the, the left of a, of a community clinic that had been standing for many decades and no one came. And people said, well, you're never gonna be able to provide care there because people don't trust the system and they have stigma and they go to traditional healers. But what we did were just four very simple things. We made sure the staff was paid and was there all the time made sure there were drugs because there were no drugs in the cupboard, make sure that it wasn't financially difficult for people to use the services, and then hired and trained an army of community health workers to accompany people who were sick to the clinic. And within just a couple months, the clinic is full. And, and that is because people trust when there are services available and they see themselves and their neighbors getting better. And so again, this has to be done sort of all the time, not just in a pandemic. And there was, you know, a lot of discussion of, you know, people not thinking COVID was real and still thinking that. Um, and I think there's a general mistrust of the medical system, the government in the United States that is really far beyond anything I've seen in other countries that I work. So, you know, bringing systems to scale, like for us is really building that ro robust community health program, making sure that health centers have the tools they need and the staff. And then when people need advanced care, that that advanced care is there. And, and you know, that was very clear to us during COVID-19 around the world because many, many countries in Africa had no oxygen whatsoever. So we, we needed to scale up our ability to provide particularly acute respiratory care. <clears throat> I happen to have COVID right now, so that's why I'm coughing. <clears throat> so none of us are immune. Um, so 
But you know, what is what does that scale up look like around the world? We've seen that. So here in Rwanda, uh, you see in 2004, there were very little, few places in the country to get ART, which is the treatment for HIV. And within less than 10 years, these treatment services were available everywhere, everywhere in the country. And what does that mean? Well, that means that it's more accessible to where people live. And it also means that those clinics have services, general services, not just HIV, right? So that is how you engender trust. You have a problem, HIV, you deal with the problem at scale, opening the doors of clinics, staffing them, stocking them. And then people say, hey, this system works for me. And I think this is the kind of system that engenders trust. This is some of the great data from, from uh, Rwanda in terms of the first 10 years of HIV coverage when they had extraordinarily high rates of HIV treatment going on. Um, when we face the cholera epidemic in Haiti, interestingly, those slides that I showed here, <clears throat> these clinics that were built really on the back of HIV scale up to say, put in essential drugs, um, you know, decrease user fees, make sure their staff, they're hire and train community health workers. We suddenly had a, a network of clinics um, that saw high volumes of patients. And on the left, you see the, the front of a clinic in St. Mark, Haiti, that suddenly overnight had people sleeping on mattresses in the floor and adults who died of diarrheal disease. And our team was, because they had seen so many patients over so many years, they immediately could see this is different, right? Because if, you don't, if you're never seeing any patients, how would you ever find an epidemic? So we didn't do general care as pandemic preparedness, but it served to prepare us because our team recognized right away before the CDC, before the World Health Organization that there was cholera there in Haiti. And so within hours, we could respond and we had IV fluids that were available without interruption because we were doing that for the health system. We had doctors and nurses who had been trained in public health because that was the strengthening strategy and were able to, in an hour, mobilize an army of community health workers to go around and do education and try to hand out chlorine tablets and things like that. So all of these systems were not built for cholera they, they were built for healthcare and for equity. And so then they can be used to respond. <clears throat> this is a picture from the early days in the Ebola epidemic in West Africa when the, there was no care being given in the Ebola treatment units. People were just separated there and literally left there to die with the idea that they at least won't infect anyone else. And so no one wanted to go. Um, but once care was provided, food was provided, then of course people came forward and their experience was totally different. Um, and you know, some of these really horrible places now, uh, you know, this is a, a clinic in Liberia, now have you know good quality care, um, including oxygen, blood supply, et cetera. And those all have helped with the subsequent epidemics we've had of loss of fever and COVID, et cetera. Uh, this is a hospital that we built in the middle of Haiti uh, as, as a response to the earthquake. Um, and of course it has become the central hospital for COVID in the country. Um, again, it was built as a response to another problem, but then uh, provided the capacity and the, you know, and same with labs. So last is just talk quickly about leadership. Um, I think Jacinda Ardern, who is widely recognized as probably one of the most effective leaders during COVID, uh, the prime minister of New Zealand. And she said this, the worst case scenario is simply intolerable. The government will do all it can to protect you. None of us can do this alone. So she's speaking about solidarity. She's speaking about sort of shared sacrifice. And I, you know, New Zealand had, uh, you know, among the lowest uh, infection and death rates in the world, thanks to her leadership. And she took a lot of hits. It was not popular. It was a long lockdown. Um, and then, you know, we have a 
bad leadership. Not much more to say. So here's some of the, uh, you know, extraordinary leadership of Rwanda. It was a colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, Saban Ntazimana, who was the director of the Rwanda Biomedical Council and ran the COVID response. They did everything on, you know, very high level digital, you know, imaging. They had case finding by an army of community health workers. And within the first 44, uh, you know, the first few cases, they found 44 primary uh, cases and 10 secondary cases. And we're doing case finding, contact tracing, and, and <clears throat> when people were found to be infected or a contact, the government put them in a hotel room and paid for their food. So, you know, again, very aggressive approach to protect uh, people and they had, you know, amazing uh, responses. This is uh, just another uh, picture of us supporting uh, the government of Liberia in trying to screen people at the airport by building these small triage rooms um, and upgrading the, you know, facilities as well as providing PPE for the government. So we had been doing all that for about a year and uh, actually not a year, <laughs> time flies, for a couple of months. And uh, then Governor Charlie Baker, uh, Governor of Massachusetts asked us if we Partners in Health would help in uh, the state of Massachusetts because he understood that there were regular tools like community health and contact trace and case investigation, as well as an equity agenda that we had had experience with. And so we said, yes, we'll do that. And we got a large multi-year contract from the state of Massachusetts to support the Department of Public Health and local boards of health to do uh, COVID prevention. And then uh, a few weeks later, we got a large grant uh, from a philanthropic organization to provide this kind of support in cities and states around the United States. So our contribution was really around these four things to make sure people had access to testing, which, as you remember, was not easy in the beginning and um, trying to get everyone to test. When they were tested and they tested positive, we would call them or visit them and say you've had a positive test. These are the things you need to do. Who have you been in contact with? Right. Get the and, and then trace all the contacts. But the key thing that we did that made this about equity was to not just give information, not just to say, you know, who are your contacts? These are the things you need to do, but to ask the simple question, can you do that, right? You have to, um, you know, isolate, you have to have food, you can't go to work, you can, and to say, can you do that? And if not, how can we help? And that last piece, that support piece, is from us, you know, lessons learned over decades of trying to fight for equity. So this is uh, what our Massachusetts work looked like. We had case investigators, those uh, talking to those who had a, a positive test, the contact tracers, you know, working with uh, those who might have been exposed. And then that last group, which we called the care resource coordinators, who provided that material support, whether it's food, transportation, uh, shelter, or access to medical care. Those care resource coordinators uh, were our approach to accompaniment and to say that whatever it is, you we will help you. They spoke 23 languages. Many of them were very experienced professionals, social workers, nurses, psychologists and they were in the communities where people lived. Um, and so they were able to connect everyone with local resources, um, et cetera. <clears throat> so what we found is when we asked that question, can you do this? Um, you know, many people said no, right? Uh, and I think in, if you think about it in the richest state and the richest country in the world, you have, you know, 9% of people um, who, who aren't able to, um, you know, deal with, um, 
with the, the stress of this on their own and the large number of problems, uh, you know, uh, uh, among the problems, food, food insecurity was number one. Um, so, you know, based on this, we were asked to support, uh, you know, work around the uh, country. And I'm just going to highlight a, a couple of things and then I'll stop and we'll have time for questions. So one of the communities that asked for our help is a community of farm workers in Immokalee, Florida. Um, there's a great organization called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and they fought for you know, economic justice uh, for, for migrant farm workers for, for a very, very long time. Um, this is a big protest they had um, against Wendy's uh, that they won. And they have something called the Fair Food Project where um, <clears throat> farms are accredited if they're treating farm workers fairly and that they've pressured a lot of these big, uh, you know, fast food chains to only buy from these accredited farms. Um, and they've raised their daily wage significantly in doing this, but you know, they're still very poor. And um, when COVID hit the farm worker community, it hit very, very hard. Uh, people live in very poor settings um, and have no job protection if they have to, have to isolate or be sick. So we worked with the Department of Health in Collier County, Florida, and trained local people to be community health workers and worked with a local church and the local health department to make sure that people had uh, food and money uh, so that they could um, isolate properly and, and take care of one another. So we were able to really expand that throughout the, the county, uh, particularly focused on the farm worker community. Okay. Somehow, oh, there we go. So again, you know, this is where you've got the the biological thing, which is equal, right? What are the social forces? Well, if you have a farm worker, if you have somebody who's low English proficiency, if you have whatever, and then what's the political, you know, issue? Well, in Massachusetts, we had a governor who's very interested in doing whatever it took, right? But in Florida. The farm workers were not on anybody's radar for vaccination campaigns, for test kits, for anything like that. So, you know, these are forces that are going to really disrupt, um, you know, and, and cause a lot of problems. But you can see the kind of work we did to sort of provide care um, and focus on equity, trust. Um, so, you know, these four things, we engage community health workers in Immokalee. Uh, working with the, the church, Mission Peniel for food and social support, working to build bridges with the state, uh, which, um, you know, had not often been very supportive of farm workers, and then coordinating with the allies that we could find there in the state of Florida. So just to wrap up, um, you know, to say that when we think of pandemic preparedness, we have to think about equity and injustice and the ways that um, that ill health get into the body through the social fabric of uh, places we live and work. Um, and that just the inputs to a health system alone uh, it, it are insufficient. And I think the, the catastrophe that's befallen the United States in COVID is uh, really just shows you that without leadership, you will end up in sort of chaos. Um, and, you know, focusing on health as a human right uh, and equity and addressing vulnerability to, to us is really the central work that needs to be done to prepare for pandemics. So I will stop there and happy to um, take any questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Joya. Um, we'll take questions like normally um, at the two mics at the front of the stage. Um, and if you've got more than one, then join the queue um, at the back again. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Karishma. I'm from Brookfield, Wisconsin. Um, I just had a question because you talked about how trust is so important. Um, taking the perspective of the United States, what do you think is the first step to building more trust within our healthcare system and pandemic response? Mm -hmm. um, I think the first step is at least investing in what we have already. I think uh, community health centers, which really grew out of the civil rights movement, they're sometimes called federally qualified health centers. Um, if they can be made whole financially so they can provide uh, care, the proper care. Um, there are networks now of some community health workers, but it's not normative. So I think working on that first layer to expand that uh, would be go a long way to improving um, that. And then I am a proponent of Medicare for all. I think that the fragmentation of our of our health, uh, health services, which is really around the lines of insurance really just is so discouraging to people. Um, the, you know, one of the top causes of homelessness among families is medical bills. And that was even before the pandemic. So I think we've got to really fix the insurance system, uh, easier said than done, and focus on really expanding the, the primary care framework uh, so that people have access to at least that first level of care. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Annika and I'm from Nino, Wisconsin. So one of the problems in healthcare is it not being available in low income communities because it's not profitable for those companies. So my question is how can we encourage healthcare companies to go into these communities that are sy systemically disadvantaged or is there different ways we can reach them? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very huge problem uh, with the market based system we have for uh, for health, and there are countries around the world that don't have that. <laughs> you know, it's not a profit issue; it's a human rights issue. And so, I think at least a step towards something like Medicare for all uh, would equal the playing field a bit. Uh, uh, you know, I never, I, I would certainly not consider myself an expert on U.S. healthcare. Um, seeing it as I did in the middle of a pandemic, after many, many years of being a, you know, global health person. Um, but I think we've got to fix the way health is delivered. It's very, very expensive, and it's not, you know, it's, it's the, it's the the CEOs <laughs> at, that are making the money, right? It's not even the people who are providing the care. So I think we've got to think about a more equitable approach. And Medicare is, you know, more equitable for sure. Um, you know, another option is at least to expand the safety net programs like Medicaid, which is more of a safety net uh, program, or CHIP, which is the Children's Health program, but you know, the politics of healthcare in the United States are very, very challenging compared to other places in the world. We don't have these kind of problems and in many European countries, Latin America, well, Latin America is getting co-opted, but yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jack Alden. I'm from Coralville, Iowa. I just more of a clarification question. Um, what are CHWs? Oh, sorry, community health workers. So community health workers in many systems in the United States as well, are people who are from the community. They're generally not trained as medical people per se, but they're, they, they do get some training often from the Red Cross or something. And they can do a variety of functions to extend care to people at community level. So in some places, for example, they may deliver medicines to people who can't easily get to the hospital. In other places, they'll do vaccination campaigns um, in communities that otherwise would be hard to reach. So they're community members who have some training but are part of the health system, not separate from it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so I think there are no more questions from the audience. Um, if that's the case, I'll just end the recording.